All right, Nick, over to you. Good to go. All right. OK, well, uh, thank, thanks, everyone. And yeah, I appreciate everyone uh, joining today. And, uh, you know, as I was thinking of the topic, you know, I've done a number of user group presentations. We, we, uh, I believe there was one in the Omar user group around Terraform and some of the infrastructure's code tools. So as we were thinking of what we wanted to present today, I really wanted to show a lot of real world scenarios uh, around what I've been doing um, with, with customers and what I've done from the real world uh, when, when we sort of embrace automation at scale. Uh, and so quite a lot to cover here. You know, probably got about you know 20, 20 plus minutes of slides here, and then we're going to just get into the demo, uh, and then we can talk through some of the advanced concepts if we want to get further in. And people have questions, happy to happy to jump in. But we'll be touching uh, ServiceNow, Terraform, or we'll, we'll GitHub, or we'll kind of Azure. Obviously, we'll show you all the all how all these things connect together. Uh, so just briefly about about me, and just kind of pull the slide out here. Uh, so I'm the chief architect for cloud and DevOps at Ahead. So I work with a number of Fortune 500 companies, helping them, you know, architect Azure infrastructure, helping them automate against that infrastructure, uh, modern applications and DevOps teams. Uh, I'm also the co-founder instructor at Skylands Academy. You've probably seen a number of training courses where I teach Azure certification, uh, Microsoft certified trainer, and I'm, I'm very fortunate to have received an MVP award last year. So very, very thankful for that. And uh, yeah, and if you've got any questions outside of this or any, about any of the Microsoft programs, I'm happy. To, happy to help you in, in that area as well. So with that, let me jump uh, straight into auto automation at, at scale here and, and how we're going to go through that. So first thing we'll hit is uh, just observations, what, what I see happening uh, as people you know, scale out teams around cloud and, and what, what's going well, what's not going well there. Uh, understanding consumption, I think there's a tendency to rush into the tools and immediately start developing infrastructure's code, but it's important to understand the architecture, the patterns, the personas of people uh, that we're supporting as IT. Uh, and then how do we put this all together? You know, how does it all integrate together? It's never just one tool. Uh, so how do we piece those together? And then what are some of the Azure tools that are out there in the in the ecosystem? Uh, then I'll show you a demo of that. We'll go into a portal that, that I've created um, with a number of members of my team uh, and show you some examples from everything from just a basic VM provisioning uh, to a you know more complicated environment on demand if you want to see some of that as well. And we can take questions and, and talk through some of those as well. Um, but with that, let's uh, let's jump straight into it. Uh, so first of all, uh, this is kind of the traditional problem that is sort of, you know, Ha happening again in the in the cloud world to some extent as uh, teams are sort of you know used to being sort of VMware team and network team and storage team and you know they would sort of you know request they would put a ticket in uh, and then it might bounce around between a bunch of teams inside the enterprise uh, and ultimately that request that maybe they just wanted a server maybe they wanted a new Azure subscription maybe they wanted a DevOps pipeline created for them uh, but it feels like we're sort of passing this piece of paper around between teams uh, until ultimately they get what they want and unfortunately it just takes a takes a lot of time and, and during that there's a lot of manual steps you know somebody might be going into the Azure portal and clicking around uh, there's reliability issues just because provisioning can be inconsistent as we move from dev you know to stage to, to prod uh, and the business ultimately just wants to move faster they, they want visibility into this and, and ultimately we want to increase satisfaction so um, you know, I definitely, you know, when we get into the Q&A &A at the end, I would love to hear, you know, from you guys if this kind of resonates and, you know, if you've seen a lot of the still as, as you kind of form your cloud teams. Uh, but this is what we ultimately are trying to solve with with integrated automation um, tool in that, that, that we leverage today. Um, so the questions we consider when we think of the application teams and what we as a cloud team today want to provide to them, we have to think about, OK, well, who are the personas? Who are the consumers? How do they want to interface uh, with, with with the technology and, and, and request that technology? Uh, who are the you know providers servicing up that technology? So Azure, you know whether it's on-prem with Azure Stack, whether it's public cloud Azure, how are we providing that? Maybe we're multi-cloud and can talk through that as well uh, if we want to get into that. And then um, we've got a uh, you know various patterns that we want to provide. So the the issue here is that we've got you know teams when we think of the personas. We've got application teams that are very advanced, are embracing DevOps and developing, you know, CI/CD pipelines, 
And then we've also got personas that are still coming to us and saying, hey, I really just want a VM and then just give me that and then I'll, I'll go and build what I want. Uh, and each of those personas requires us to assemble these patterns uh, in a different way. Uh, and so this section you know, is all about how do we you know, provide those capabilities and services in, in the correct way to the, to the people requesting them. So if we think of those two personas and the traditional persona, if you will, they, they really want to log into a portal, fill out a form, maybe put a ticket in it, ticket in. They, they're not necessarily very familiar with the infrastructure, build pipelines, APIs. You know, again, they just want to get their VM provisioned or another asset provisioned. Uh, but our advanced users get very frustrated when we say to them, uh, hey, you're, you know, this is a DevOps API uh, user or DevOps team essentially that wants to come in and consume via an API. They, they don't want to go to a form uh, and fill it out 15 times for, for a VM or for a stack of, of infrastructure. They've, they've already embraced some of these, these new principles. And so, you know, we need, we need to, you know, create automation to, to provide services to both of these, these groups today. And in some cases, we're more tightly coupled with the group on the, on the right. Um, then we, again, we've got to look at the services that we're consuming. So maybe as part of this, we develop an automation hub and we say, yep, we're going to, you know, surface up Azure Stack infrastructure, public cloud infrastructure, services at the edge. It's not necessarily just, um, you know, again, VMs today. It's, it's evolved a lot, a lot more from that. So to do that, we ultimately have to have building blocks. And if you've developed in any of the infrastructure's code tools like ARM or Terraform, uh, these essentially can be line items or segments of code with, within there. Uh, they could be individual modules, they could be scripts, they could, you know, it could be PowerShell scripts and other tools and techniques. Uh, but ultimately, if you sort of break it down and think about what categories of service you're providing, uh, it's everything from administrative metadata requirements that we want to enforce. So maybe we've got Azure policy templates and Azure initiatives that we're assigning. Uh, we've got typical compute network storage uh, services we're, we're uh, creating as well, uh, DR and backup uh, solutions, and, and, and we go on from there. So we, we ultimately know that we, we, we need to um, get things down into these building blocks because one of the biggest problems you know, I've seen at scale is everybody's reinventing the wheel. wheel. They, they generate these big, big uh, scripts or big Azure CLI scripts, PowerShell scripts, ARM templates, uh, and then another team is going on and doing the same thing. So a big part of the efficiencies at scale with large enterprises is learning to modularize, create reuse, and share that code out uh, with, with the teams. Uh, then what we can do is we can take uh, those services and those micro segment uh, pieces of code and then assemble those into blueprints and then publish them in, in, into a catalog. So blueprints are created from services and then depending on the persona through some environment decisions, we may just ask them business questions and security questions and then that would determine you know, how, the, how the service gets, gets provisioned. What it looks like in the end, you know, it doesn't matter if you're on-prem, multi-cloud, however you're doing it, you ultimately take in uh, services from the public cloud providers. The cloud team's role has ultimately changed now to, to, to wrap infrastructure as code uh, around the services that we want to provide. So these could be a couple of regions in Azure uh, where we say, yep, every time I'm provisioning an Azure storage account so for blob storage, I want to make sure encryption is enabled. Uh, every time I provision VM, I want certain standards available. Maybe that's on AVS as an example. Uh, and then all these services, you start to develop and build a service library that ultimately we can then service up to our consumers of IT technology. And that's very different because well, this is where we start to get the scale now. A lot of, lot of organizations are moving into a decentralized model, uh, which means they don't want to keep coming back to a central shared service. But the problem is, what, you know, what I've seen at, at scale is those teams then just create, get into a lot of mistakes, um, you know, whether they're cost overruns, security issues, et cetera. Uh, and so it's the cloud team's role now to really try to sort of move into more of a platform team and say to these application teams, hey, I want to help you get that. I've got all this, you know, infrastructure's code pre-developed, uh, ready to go. Odds are I've probably solved your problem uh, for another application team. How do I, you know, now, now surface that up to you? Um, so that's the, you know, if we workflow through that, that's, that's essentially where we're getting. I think it's also really, really important to contrast the traditional way you can put this together versus a modern infrastructure's code way. So in a traditional way, 
say you would order a web server and you you know would build a VM with a with um, you know IS on it, for example, uh, you might have somebody go into fill out a form. They say, hey, I want a web server. And then the traditional way is we sort of pass these, uh, you know, the scripts basically talking to various APIs, but it's typically sequential. Uh, one at a time, we're generating a server name, uh, we hit an IPAM, we go into AD. This is very much what you would see on-prem still today. And when we do it on-prem, uh, a lot of times we still have to automate in this way just because we have so much complexity of tooling in the data center. And you know, once the VM is built, we hand over to Config Management, Ansible, Puppet Chef, whatever you're using today. Uh, and then we go and fill out maybe a change control to say, hey, this is online, is it certified from security, et cetera. And that's, a, that's the traditional flow. Uh, what's changed uh, as we develop in Azure, for example, we would define our resources in something like Terraform, ARM um, template, you know, leverage and bicep. Uh, the, these, the, the workflow ultimately changes here. So when we think about this, we're, we're going to define the resources. We've got our SQL Server, monitoring, service registry, AD credentials. There's more code, and I'll go through some Terraform code later on of how we build a Linux VM, and I can break, break it down for you. Um, so this, these are just at the high level, the segments of code there. Um, but the key here is when you want to build something uh, using, say, Terraform now, we're going to take that code. We're going to do a Terraform apply. Uh, it's going to create that server and map those dependencies automatically. Uh, and then the key thing there is it stores it in a state file uh, for day two operations. So when you're using Terraform Cloud, when you log in and you create a Terraform workspace uh, and you do Terraform applies from there, you know, that state file is going to be stored there. If you're doing it from your laptop, that, that file will just be stored, you know, locally or in a remote remote uh, bucket if you, if you go that direction. Um, the key though is as you move into day two operations, uh, things are very different now. We can't necessarily have people going into the Azure portal and going and changing everything because ultimately we built this under the assumption that this is tied to a Terraform workspace, a Git repository. Uh, there's a state file that's saying this is the current state of the of the service running. Uh, and if somebody goes and changes it manually, um, then it's going to be out of whack from you know what it what it should be. Uh, so when we do day two operations, it's very different. We need to change the culture to say, hey, if you want to change it, you're going to need to come change the code and check that in. And so the, the process would be something like this. You would go into your Terraform code. Uh, you would uh, you know, look at, say, you adjusted a monitoring rule. You would update the code, uh, do a Terraform plan and apply. And that would actually get triggered automatically from the Git check-in. Uh, and then you, know, you can see only change required is to monitor and we reference the current state and so we go ahead and 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 make those changes, you know, just to the piece that needs updated. So as you try to piece all this together, and I'm going to jump out our slides here, so we can we can we can talk through this a little bit more detail. Um, and you you look at the personas uh, that you have. You know, you've got the you've got that traditional persona. That's somebody that maybe wants to go to a catalog and develop, uh, you know, and, and make that request from something like ServiceNow or ShareWell, or one of the other tools you might be using. Uh, on the bottom left, we've got developers. They may be using Jenkins, they may be using Terraform natively, you know, whatever um, they, they've decided to leverage. But they, they've got varying degrees of, of tool chains uh, that they're trying to develop. And then the question becomes is, well, how do we, how do we service both of these? And then on the right-hand side, we've got these providers from public cloud and private cloud services. Uh, how do we how do we surface that up? Um, the the common pattern that I see in in Azure is it, Azure DevOps becomes your your orchestrator in this scenario. So they may use it as the pipeline tool that could orchestrate uh, hand off to Terraform. Terraform will then do your pre-deploy tasks. That could be you know generating name, could be you know some system we want to talk to. Uh, we may use Azure DevOps to talk to that system, just depending on what it is, if Terraform's got a provider or not. And I'll, I'll talk through our providers a little bit more in a minute. Um, and then you would deploy your workload. And that's where it would actually go and create that infrastructure in Azure, uh, deploy it, um, you know, or multi-cloud if we need to, if we have services running in multiple locations. And then we move over to those post-deploy deploy tasks. And that could mean talking to something like Puppet, Chef, Ansible, to go and do some some configuration on top. Um, all of this then becomes a, a pattern. Um, so we stitch it all together and then we present it as a complete pattern, whether that's going to be consumed via a catalog up here or consumed via an API. Uh, we've developed a pattern that, that, that those users can access and, and leverage them directly. 
Um, so hopefully that makes sense. We'll, we'll get get back uh, into more of that, you know, in the Q and A if there's if there's more questions around that. So when we look at um, tooling, let me just go to full screen again here. When you look at what the infrastructure as code tools are provided, um, that's really the provisioning of your platform resources. So this is your infrastructure automation. So these would be your Azure virtual machines, Azure app services, whatever whatever it might be. Uh, then you would have, um, you know, this could also be ARM templates, obviously, um, AWS uses cloud formation, but um, for Azure and the good thing about, you know, Terraform is it's multi-cloud. A lot of, lot of people today use Terraform for, for Azure for that reason as well. Uh, and it'll work with Azure Stack as well. Uh, the, it doesn't necessarily reduce the need for your config management tools, though. So uh, if and then this is more around the operating system, I recognize these vendors have other functions, too. Um, but typically, when we build a virtual machine, we would still then hand over from ARM templates or Terraform uh, to Puppet, Chef, Ansible uh, to define additional con configuration settings. So this could be installing some software that needs to run inside the virtual machine, update app set and service plan, um, et cetera. Those are, those are the kind of things we would do there. Uh, so think of those as, you know, after the infrastructure, if there's other things we need to do that Terraform isn't necessarily very good at, then we, then we would move over to config management tools. So if you haven't seen uh, Terraform code before, uh, there's typically, you know, four, four major pieces when you sort of define in the resource, you'll have the statement of resource, uh, we'll have our provider. So everything in Azure, we use the Azure RM provider, uh, the type here. So in this case, I'm, I'm creating a resource group. Uh, and this is the name of the object in Terraform, not necessarily the name of the resource group, which you'll see when we, we get into the code. But uh, it's a very simple language, very easy to understand, very easy to, you know, once you get used to it and you've provisioned a few resources there, and I believe there was a session uh, on that already, it, it just becomes, you know, sec second nature over time. Uh, the way that executes uh, is through a plan, execute, destroy workflow. So when you first uh, run Terraform, you would do a Terraform plan. If you haven't seen this before, uh, that would tell you what's going to change. It would look at your, your code that you've created, uh, compare it to the, the target environment uh, and tell you what, what's ultimately going to happen. It also checks it's even going to work and make sure you authenticate it, et cetera. Uh, then you would have Terraform apply and then a, you know, which actually goes and takes effect and then Terraform destroys when you just say Terraform destroy, confirm and it will delete and clean up all of all of that infrastructure for you. So that's that's the process we, we follow through. Um, there are a number of other automation tools. So we know, I'm going to jump back to the slide here for a second. Uh, you know, we might use I don't know, the Azure DevOps icon to hand here, but just assume this is Azure DevOps here. Uh, you know, you might use Azure DevOps here. You might use Puppet or Chef or Ansible down here as a service engine. We obviously can use ARM or Terraform in here. We might use Azure DevOps down here. The good thing is Microsoft has a complete ecosystem, and, and, and generally a lot of a lot of people I work with use Azure DevOps and a lot of the tool in there, and then hand off just ready to Terraform to do some other tasks, um, and then you know cust custom scripts at that point. So um, it's you don't have to just use those tools though. There there are a lot of others. Um, so I thought it would be worth having a quick just update on where these where these fit. Um, so Azure Automation, I see used primarily for a lot of uh, just regular operational tasks. Uh, one of the key benefits of Azure Automation for things like startup shutdown, I'm sure you're all familiar when you go into Azure and you build a VM, you can set an auto shutdown time You know when you do that. So it shuts off at say 5 p.m. or whenever people go home if they don't need that service run in. Uh, Azure Automation, one of the big use cases that I see for it is you can actually create a JSON tag uh, inside your, your tag in for your service or on your resource group. Azure Automation can pick that up and you can actually start to set uh, start and shut down times, you know, be off on weekends, off on holidays, all sorts of things like that. So the, this can help you save money. Uh, there's also a lot of other benefits just in terms of operational tasks. If you want to do routine checks on the environment, uh, you can leverage, you know, PowerShell inside here you know, to go and check something in your Azure environment. Uh, GitHub Actions is another one. So if you want to trigger directly off GitHub, um, you know, GitHub Actions is another way. Again, you can you can create custom. You can go as far as to create REST API calls uh, from there or other tasks that you want to achieve. Uh, PowerShell, Azure CLI, we've talked about those. Hopefully everyone's familiar at this at this point with those. Uh, but those are there. And then you know, Puppet Chef Ansible. 
um, aren't the aren't the only config management. Microsoft does have Azure Automation DSC uh, works for, for you know to to an extent, and then they advise you know Microsoft advisors to kind of look at the more um, you know industry you know standard con config management tools there. Uh, so just see where they, it's not to say the ones I'm talking about are exhaustive. You could you could tie these in uh, as well if you want to. Um, so if you're thinking, in, in the last slide before we sort of jump into some of the demo pieces here, uh, well, how would I, how do I start something like this? It seems like there's a there's a lot here. Well, um, when I work with large enterprises and we have you know gone around and interviewed teams that have done this very very well, they sort of have an automation hub, if you will as a North Star, um, that's where they want to get to. And I'll show you that here in a second, uh, what that looks like visually. But there's also other things that are really important that you have to think about is, you know, am I going to create style guides for the teams now? I'm going to create code and standards. Who's the governing body? If I'm going to adopt a new service from Azure, who's going to develop the standards, the procedures, the security requirements for that? Uh, and once you've got this sort of North Star established, and I, you know, maybe it's a small team um, that you, you have inside your organization um, initially, then you can you know start to expand from there and start to build these and get into the fun pieces of these uh, and then uh, i'm not going to cover anything around agile today but just developing an agile uh, approach so you you know you've got a punch down list and automation never ends it's not a point in time project uh, you want to embrace those software development principles now at the at the infrastructure layer and that just means being very very deliberate about it and actually you know treating everything we do in cloud as a as a you know software development uh, type approach now with that let me show you what this uh, looks like and hopefully everything is still logged in here don't need that let's see okay so just gonna log into all these tools i did pre-provision one here so we can have all that uh okay so i've got three um three tools i'm gonna make sure open here uh one this is the portal uh for an automation hub which i'll walk through in a second uh, i've got terraform workspaces uh sorry terraform cloud running here so i've got terraform workspace running here i created one omaha user group uh, one already so we've got something pre-provisioned uh, and then I've got a Omaha repo one, but um, I'll show you how it creates those and then we'll we'll go through the, the code in more, more detail. Um, the, the end result of this is we, we're trying to get to the point where I can go into a catalog uh, and say I want to build a virtual machine. Uh, first of all, I can go in here uh, and you know maybe I want to show the price as I do that to the end user. So right now you can see there's no virtual machine costs. Maybe I've got some managed service charges. Maybe I've got some you know other service charges and then ultimately get to my my overall monthly cost and so uh what we essentially do here is we we download the rate card um or you can query it directly although it takes longer if you do it do it live and it doesn't update you know updated contractually uh with microsoft so we take the rate card uh we embed that into a table uh inside of service now whatever whatever tool you want to use you know ultimately you just got to have a way to query it locally you know with your catalog whatever you decide to use there uh, and then you can start to fill out your form, right? So I could say, hey, I'm Nick Collier. Uh, I've got an you know, application. You know, we we do all our demos model after an airline company. Uh, so bag management is one of the services we you know we offer there. Um, and you know, this is my cost center that that I've got there as well. And there's, nothing's changed up here yet. This is just business information that ultimately would get tagged uh, to the to the virtual machine or whatever it is I'm building. Uh, so then I could say, yep, I want to build this in production. Uh, we've limited now the region, so you can choose to uh, limit the, the selection criteria, and you can do that based on different application teams that you're servicing as well. So perhaps I'm only allowing deployments in Central US. Uh, I want Windows. Uh, you know, can put a machine name in here or have it auto-generated, uh, and then I can also guide. Right, we know that the D series are our general instances. Um, the E series are our memory optimized, F series, CP1 optimized. You've got storage with B burstable uh, series there. So I can choose D, I'll get my D series. If I choose general, I'm going to get my typical, you know, D, D4, S, V3, Azure VM size that I've got there. Uh, I can choose my OS selection. So maybe I'm using a premium SSD uh, that I've got here. I choose my quantity and yes or no, do I want to back, back it up, right? And, and ultimately then I start to get the cost. Uh, and the user can just click submit here, uh, and that will basically go off, you know, hit hit Azure DevOps, and then go and go and build a build a server for them, and they'll they'll get an email when that's uh, requested. Uh, if I go back though, the, the the real challenge is, 
Um, that's not really enough for most people today. They, they want uh, a little bit more than just a VM. They maybe want a stack, maybe they want a pipeline. And so really what, what I, I find we're doing a lot more of now is a couple of things. One, either creating a complete environment on demand uh, or creating Terraform workspaces on demand. So an environment on demand uh, project, for example, uh, you know, I won't go through this whole form here, but you, you know, it would be your DevOps project, yeah, your Kubernetes host size that you would want, the AKS version you want to use, cluster name, namespace, what runtime stack. So now I can say, hey, I, you want to you want to develop in Node.js and you want to develop a, a whole environment, uh, you can go in here, fill out this form, and you can decide how many of these fields you want to give them, how many you don't. But these ultimately translate to variables that get passed into Azure DevOps that then will go and build the uh, entire um, you know, pipeline end end. This takes you know, about 40 minutes to do, um, but uh, happy to share a link on and some videos I've recorded on that one as well. Um, the, the other key piece is the, the Terraform workspace has now become a very, very uh, common uh, request um, that I see typically. So you know, the most basic example I've got here, uh, this catalog item will create a GitHub code repo a, it will leverage a Terraform template for a Linux VM on Azure. Uh, it'll connect the Terraform workspace with the variables so it can authenticate against Azure. Uh, and then it will link that Terraform workspace to the GitHub repo. And so the key thing here is we don't want to necessarily write the code every time. We've probably got a, Terraform, a, a Linux VM template that we've created for Azure. Uh, we've probably got a template repo that we can clone directly from. Uh, and then we just need to make sure all these things are linked together. So I'll flip the format in a minute, but I do want to show you, um, you know, what it looks like just under the under the covers a little bit. And let me see if I can zoom in. Yeah, I forget where the zoom is. Yeah, I think it's Control Plus Plus. Yeah, there we go. On, on VS Code. So, so in uh, in Terraform, we're going to walk walk through the code here. Uh, the first thing we've got is our provider block, and this just says that we're using uh, the Azure RM provider. Uh, we've got our resource group that we're creating um, in Azure. Uh, we'll create our virtual network. Uh, and you can see, uh, just as back to that model, uh, resource Azure RM virtual network, my first tier VNet. Uh, this is the name of the VNet. This is the address space we're going to give it. It's the same as if you went into the portal and click create VNet. Uh, you can just define it all here with just a very small, small block of code. So this is going to go in East US. Uh, and then it's going to reference the resource group uh, that we created above here. So you'll see uh, this name here, if I sort of highlight my first TFRG, uh, is referencing that object um, that, that we create first of all. So you typically create your resource group uh, and then move down. And then within our VNet, uh, we, we would create our subnet, any public IPs we need for the, the VMs. This is gonna be demo VM01, uh, create the NSG security rules, create the network interface, uh, and then I'm going to scroll down some more because I want to walk through the VM portion of this. So, so this is essentially the code for creating the VM itself. And here we've got demo uh, VM01 Linux East US, uh, the resource group name being referenced, the size DS1 V2. Uh, we're going to create an OS disk, it's going to be premium locally redundant storage. Uh, here's the image we're going to reference the clone from, and then some various keys and, and pieces we put in. So the key is, you know, there's, there's a fair amount of code here. And maybe we want to give somebody a Terraform workspace with a pre-created VM, a Linux VM template in there uh, that can be requested and provisioned on, on demand. So if we go back to the form here, I'm basically saying, again, I'm a Collier. Uh, let me put a business unit here. I'll just say MIT uh, workspace. Let me make sure I don't use the same one. So I used Omaha UG1. So we'll call this Omaha UG2. Uh, and then we'll call it Omaha Repo 02. Uh, and then hit submit here. Uh, and ultimately, what I'm basically doing, I'm sending, all I'm doing is taking that data uh, from this form, I'm sending a REST API call out. Uh, that's ultimately connecting to the, uh, an orchestrator that connects to these systems. So if we go into the uh, Terraform workspace, I'll just see, it might take a little bit for it to create. Okay, we can already see it there. So Omaha user group two, uh, this is already uh, now created. Uh, the variables are created in here, uh, and I'll come back to these in a minute. And then we'll also see the version control is connected as well. So if I go into settings version control, uh, you can see that this is connected to GitHub uh, into a repo, uh, Omaha repo 02. So if I go back over here and I go back to my GitHub here, 
I should see a Omaha repo 02, uh, and that is there. And then you can see in here, in the repo, I've got my Linux VM uh, .tf, and that essentially is the same as what we, we looked at there. I'm cloning from a template repo, so there's a few slight differences in the code that, that's in my template repo. But the key thing here, as you can see, we've added to the, the block here, is the subscription ID. Uh, so this is the Azure subscription that we want to uh, essentially uh, leverage, uh, uh, leverage when we provision. So what we don't want to do is store the client ID, the client secret, the tenant ID, all of that in Terraform code. People have done it and they've been exposed to the public and you know somebody's gonna, gonna find it very, very quickly. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, do some uh, blockchain and, you know, get some cryptocurrency going pretty, pretty quickly there. Uh, so we definitely, you know, don't want to expose that. Uh, so the way we do this is we reference, we say, yeah, we're going to have a, a variable here inside of, of uh, our Terraform workspace that we're going to use. And those can be stored inside Terraform's workspace. So if I go in here and I choose variables, you can see I've got subscription ID, it's sensitive, you're not, you're not going to see it when I, when I click in here. Uh, tenant ID, it's stored in there. Uh, client ID stored in there. Client secret stored in there. Now, this is really key because what essentially has happened is when I, when I filled out that form, if I go back here uh, and I hit submit, we, we don't ever want the end user being exposed to those credentials. So those are, are coded in here to, to create and put into the workspace variables here as sensitive variables. So they, they can't, you know, they don't, the, the app team doesn't even need to see this or worry about this. What happens then is if I go back to the code, everything else is the same. Got our demo, demo VM uh, and we'll go through. If I go back to the Terraform workspace, when it does a Terraform plan and apply, uh, it's essentially running a trigger. Anytime that code is updated, uh, it'll it'll run again. So if you change the uh, Terraform code, it'll essentially up, update and then and then trigger another build there uh, and go ahead. And so this is this this workspace is tied now to that code repo, and the product I'm delivering to my application team is essentially the code repo with the workspace, with the sample code they needed because we, we gave them the template with the Linux VM there. Uh, and then they can now take it from there. They can go in and update, you know, download that Terraform code to their workstation they can update it. They can add additional modules. Uh, you know, you will, you know, as part of using Terraform, you'll get into module registry up here and you can, you can build lots and lots of modules uh, that, you know, they can or, or maybe they are or aren't allowed to, to leverage. Uh, at the end of the day, not, um, you know, from a, an excitement point of view, um, demo VM01, um, you know, I built it this afternoon. So ultimately they, they get in a VM, yeah, it's nothing uh, nothing, nothing too crazy um, from that aspect. But it, now it's all managed uh, with infrastructure as code from, from that point on. So, and I think this goes back to the, the key part to stress is um, that the workflow has ultimately changed now. So if I go back to uh, this key piece here, you know, anytime, you know, we've built it using Terraform. We, we built it out, created you know the server. Everything's mapped automatically. But that that state is now in a day two state file, uh, ready for them to to use. Uh, and now, anytime I want to make changes against it, I need to ultimately go in here uh, and make the make the changes here. So, uh, very very different to somebody going through a going through a portal and 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 doing it from there. And the other thing, uh, if I go back here, uh, let me just find another slide here for a second. I'm just going to stop presenting just for a second to grab one more. I think I uh, forgot to put it in here. But I do want to talk more about the environments on demand aspect because that's where uh, the conversation naturally goes next with the app teams. While, while I'm pulling that up, are there any any questions on what I've covered so far? I know we, there's a lot here. So uh, there, there was. Here. There was one, Nick, uh, Mike was asking if you will be able to share the slides. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can I can package these up and share them. Yeah, just let me know where you want me to send them, if you send can them share to it. you, I assume. Yeah, and then. If you can share it with me, I can go ahead and publish it with the uh, recording on YouTube. Okay, fantastic. Now, with any other questions, that's the only one so far. Nothing on the chat, but if anyone has, they can probably unmute themselves and ask. Yeah, I'll I'll put um I'll package up a set of uh, links etc. And, and get them over to you. Okay. Um, 
So the the last part I really want to cover then is this this concept of environments on on demand, and essentially, uh, and I showed you that a little briefly in the in the portal there. But a developer will come in, and again, they don't really want a virtual machine anymore. So they'll go into ServiceNow, and they might say, "Yep, I want to create this application. I want to leverage Node.js. I want to leverage .NET." I want to use containers hosted on Kubernetes. I want my code repo and my pipeline integrated and ready for CI CD. And perhaps I want to attach some data services to that as well. And so when you look at the automation architecture, uh, one of the key things then is the, the automation and orchestration engine really more and more, uh, I'm just leveraging Azure DevOps these days to kind of tie a lot of these things together. So on the left hand side here, you'll see uh, Azure DevOps is the orchestrator pretty much for all of this. Uh, and it's actually going to go back and talk to Azure DevOps and create a new Azure DevOps project. Uh, then it'll go on and say, okay, I'm going to go and create a new code repository. Uh, and that could be in uh, GitHub, it could be in Asda repos, with, which is the icon here. Maybe I'm going to implement code artifact scanning. I'm going to create a new Azure container registry there. And then what what it's also going to do um, is leveraging YAML or, or other you know other ways to build the pipelines in in Azure DevOps. Uh, we can create a completely new Azure DevOps pipeline. And better yet, now I'm integrating that pipeline back into the into the code repo, uh, into the container registry. And then what I can do is pass in the sample code. Uh, this will go and create the Azure Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and that could use ARM templates, or again, it could use Terraform to do that. And then perhaps I send a notification via Teams here, uh, and then uh, pass over. Maybe I integrate some monitoring services in there. So going back again, what what I found at scale uh, is we now end up uh, developing, you know, Java on AKS, uh, .NET on AKS, uh, environment on demand, a new a new branch of a, of an existing environment, for example, um, a a new environment on demand project where we're asking all these questions that we were kind of talking through before uh, and then you know basically provisioning that entire pipeline and and to end for them uh, and if you're using other kubernetes uh, um, uh, technologies like openshift that's okay too uh, we can do that we can again start to choose sample applications uh, that we we want to um, deploy as well and so it's pretty um Pretty endless um, how far you can go with this. Uh, as part of um, one of the next iterations I'm working on um, with some people right now is essentially packaging up one click deployments. So you can take the Amazon type, you know, when you go to Amazon.com and buy something from the shop, um, they've got the one click deploy option. So the idea is that a developer can come in here. We've already pre coded or worked with them to, to, to code in using all the modules we've got, the stack they want. Uh, and they can say, yeah, one click, I want the stack. I need some sample data with it as well. Uh, and it will provision all, all of that end to end. Uh, there's also operations day two things like increased resources. We've done some uh, Azure update management with patching as well. Uh, there's sandbox environments and maybe creating sandboxes that you might create, you know, convert to full projects as well. Uh, but a lot now I would say has is, 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 is been around the, the Terraform work in particular. Um, so that's kind of the core of the, the presentation I wanted to go through. Uh, I'm happy to take questions now uh, and, and talk through any other pieces. I'm also happy to go through more of Terraform code. Um, you know, definitely like keep this interactive for the, for the last piece if possible. So happy to jump in, at, you know, to any, any key areas you want to want to kind of hit. Awesome. Nick, Mike is asking. Yeah. He's saying in a cross-platform environment, is it likely engineers within the same team will will leverage different IAC languages? That is Terraform, CloudFormation, Bicep, ARM. Yeah, what's um what's interesting is um I was just working with a very, very large airline company and they uh they started um in this decentralized model. Um and so as you can imagine, it was sort of the 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 wild west for a uh, for a little while there and um every team was sort of leveraging their own tool of choice um which is is okay to a to a point um as long as they can maintain and support those the problem is they weren't necessarily following all the all the governance standards and tagging and those kind of things as well 
Um, so I think that we, we're always up to sort of weigh up is how much are we providing those teams as a shared service uh, and how much have we empowered them to completely take take that on themselves? Um, to answer the, the question uh, more directly, when you it, it's less of an issue when you say cross platform, I, I would assume you might mean some multi cloud as well, because you know when I've, I've worked with various uh, companies and they go through acquisitions, they've got AWS, Azure, sometimes a little bit of GCP these days, you know, for certain data services as well. Um, but generally. Uh, Generally speaking, they, they, they're running into a mess because they've got three different tools and languages going on and they don't have enough people in the organization to support them. Um, so that's a, that's a key consideration. Terraform has evolved as the standard today. If you want to stick with you know, one language, one DSL language uh, and go across that, that definitely has a lot of benefits. But you know, you've got to decide if it's if it's worth paying for and, you know, do you want to, it's a build versus buy thing. Um, you know, with Terraform open source, you can do a lot, but then you've got to learn to manage state and modules and things like that. Or you you license something like Terraform uh, Cloud or, to, or Terraform Enterprise, and then they give you a lot more. So it's just how much you want to build that yourself versus uh, buy it from a from a vendor. So but I'd say the short, short answer is, uh, yeah, they'll, I mean, people are going to be passionate about technologies, but the more you can standardize them, I would say it's a lot easier. And particularly when security gets involved, they want to be able to look at the code. You know, if I go to the, let me just pull up the, um, the portal here again, uh, and you go into something like uh, Terraform, you know, in here, you can start to add Sentinel policies and things to it as well, because they want to basically go, they want to look, you know, security wants to know, uh, okay, what is it you're deploying? Does it meet our guidelines? So what's in this repo? And this is you know, nothing, nothing really concerning here. They may have concerns about, you know, the the fact. Uh, I think I've got the, you know, I don't have this one. And the, the Windows one I had before just had a basic username and password that anybody could could log into, right? So those are the things they're they're looking out for. So the more people understand it, the um, the be the better, I would say. And um, the last thing, and I know. And I'm giving you a long answer to the question. The last part I'd say is that I've also seen uh, like Azure spend go up when nobody knows who those resources are attributed to. Uh, and then when you go in and you look at the ARM template and they had a key value pair for the application CI, so they knew who it was in their cost center. Uh, well, everybody was sort of typing it in slightly differently. Some people were capitalizing it. Some people were fat fingering, like it would say app CI one and W and Q on the end. So uh, people just make mistakes. Uh, so the more you can standardize on a, on a central governed way of, of doing all this, um, you know, I, I think it's a lot easier. And then if you add policies to this to say, hey, the code needs to comply uh, with these guidelines, then uh, and, and those policies are declared as code as well, then, then things get even easier. So there was a second question in there, wasn't there? Let me ask. Yeah, his, his follow-up question was, does a head automation hub address is the issue? Yeah, head automation, I mean, that's really a reference architecture we developed. It's a, it's not a product per se. It's just a way we, you know, I, I went around with the, with my team a few years ago uh, and interviewed, you know, probably 10 of our largest Fortune 500 customers and, and looked at people that were doing it really well and had, you know, versus people that had cost runaways and security holes. And we were really just trying to learn from them. And we all had good ideas of like, hey, this is the best way to stitch it together. Um, but there was no better way than finding people that were successful at it. And so that reference architecture ultimately uh, came out of that. Um, you know, we, we leverage it, you know, we do a ton with Azure and, and those tools work there. Um, so I think the architecture, the approach works. I'm happy to share it. Um, you know, it's a, you know, happy to put it out. There's a lot of videos I've got, got out there that we've done on it as well. I've got one on the environment, the full environments on demand, which gets more and more complicated. Um, but yeah, it's really a case of um, there's the the architectures, the tooling part of it. I think you've also got to address the the people part of it. And what I would say is, you, you know, maybe the infrastructure team becomes your platform team today and then looks at those services. As I was kind of talking about, they float up and you build that catalog. Um, that that's how I would I would think about it to to address both sides. I hope Mike that answers your questions. If you if you want to talk more about it, you can unmute yourself and I think yeah, multi cloud just makes everything more complicated. It's so just uh, pick Azure and add the add the other ones if you need to. It's kind of what I would say. So. Okay. Uh, a follow-up request on the slides. Uh, Omar asked if you can also share the URLs and links that you were sharing in your yeah. slide. 
in your presentation. So if you can package them and send it my way, I can probably include that okay. or you can probably upload them somewhere and share the link I can share with the community. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I can do that. Karthik uh, okay. is asking, where do you think IAC tools like Terraform and ARM lagging that teams still have to depend on configuration management tools like yeah. Puppet and Sybil? A great question. And I'm going to pull up uh, a find it on Terraform's website here where we've got the Terraform provider list, which I think is the key thing here. Pull this up for you. OK, and let me share my screen again here. Yeah, so when you go to and, and I would encourage you just to download Terraform uh, and just just try to build something with it locally if you haven't I haven't played with it before and then I would try to do exactly where, where I think some of your questions go in and, and and what some of the issues um, run into right so when you when you look at uh, Terraform there's providers uh, and provisioners um, and so the uh, provider itself like if we look at the Azure provider um, that you know it supports tons of oh, I think I'm in the wrong section of it bear with me I thought it was all uh, bear with me a second maybe they've changed it uh, one second. It's going to Google it. I used to be able to navigate their website pretty easily, but uh, let's see here. Uh, here's the Azure um, provide. Yeah, okay, this is what I wanted. So, yeah, on the left hand side, yeah, you'll see all the services that Terraform can essentially talk to. So, yeah, Data Lake. So, if I go in here, yeah, you can see Azure RM Data Lake, and you know, they'll, they'll give you a an example here. If I go to, let me pick like a, a storage account, for example. Uh, so I pick a Azure storage account here. He has an example where, yeah, I can deploy the resource. It's got a name, it's got a location. That's the resource group there. And then he has the storage accounts. So again, resource uh, type is Azure RM storage account. This is the name in Terraform, so I can reference it throughout the code. And then, yeah, I can do everything I need to do in a storage account, right? I can give it a name, I can give it a location, I can choose the replication type and the, the tier I want. And they'll give you a whole bunch of examples and there's lots of different ways uh, to configure. The problem is, is you know, when, when you tend to get out of very solid providers, so Azure provider is phenomenal. You can see there's tons of services here. Everything we want to configure in Azure, it's basically pulling from the Azure resource manager, the ARM provider, is where, where, where Terraform's hooking into. So as soon as Microsoft releases a new service, they're very quick about releasing the ARM provider. Excuse me, uh, HashiCorp is very quick, you know, because it's open source as well. People are very quick to build the 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 Go code and connect these these together. The problem becomes when you sort of look at all the other providers and you say even things like uh, Active Directory. And I'll take a look at this one here and and see what it's uh, see if they've got any more details on it. So let me head over to this one here. Um, you can sort of go in here and see how it, how it, how well it works. Um, but is it going to do everything you need from a Active Directory uh, point of view, basically? Now, it'll do like users and groups ads and things like that. But anything complicated, the provider may be limited. Uh, and then you're going to have to either update the provider yourself uh, using Go if you want to get into it. And, you know, we've done it once um, and released it and released it up there. Um, or you just decide, do I really want to do that? Do I want to just go to another tool? Uh, and that's where Azure DevOps, I would say, orchestrates Terraform here in a lot of cases. So we'll actually, when we when we exit these forms, I typically go to Azure DevOps first, and then Azure DevOps say that it might go to AD and do something, uh, and then and then might go to Terraform for all the infrastructure that Terraform can provision. It's great because anything that Terraform can provision, I can just do a destroy and it's going to clean itself up. And we didn't really talk much about the decommissioning, but that's probably the biggest value there. But it's not very good at configuring software installs, as an example. It doesn't really have a good package manager. Uh, that's where Puppet Chef, Ansible, SaltStack, uh, PowerShell DSC uh, are just much, much better tools uh, for, for that kind of thing. So as long as it's got the provider, the good thing is, yeah, if you need to deploy infrastructure in three clouds simultaneously and write one Terraform file, you can do that. Um, but if you need to talk inside OSs and talk to other things that it doesn't have a provider for, uh, that's where you're ultimately going going to run into issues. But there are a lot, and they keep growing. Uh, today, though, I would say you're still still limited, you know, from OS config management. Hope that answers your question, Karthik. If you would like to discuss more, you can probably unmute yourself. And with that, there are no more questions. 
or comments on the chat window. If anyone would like to ask or discuss anything with Nick, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, stage can be yours. So Winnie is saying, yeah, agree. I think you can also address that problem or gap by deploying custom container images that already contain the dependencies and packages that Chef, Puppet, and Sybil would be installing. Yeah. Yeah, a good alternative. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we, I don't know if you've got a session coming up on uh, containers, but that'd be probably a good follow up at some point. So, that's good. Well, if uh, no one has anything else, I would like to thank Nick uh, on behalf of the user group. Well, thank you so much for taking time out tonight to present in the group. The session was very informative. I hope everyone would have learned out of the session. Thanks, Nick. All right. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.